Ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to welcome you. My name is David Bowers with Enterprise. It's a blessing to see all of you all here today. I'd like to invite, I think, uh, Reverend Isaac, we're going to invite Reverend Donald Isaac to the stage to offer us an invocation, blessing. I want to guess Reverend Isaac is coming up. He is, he wears, as many of you all know, many hats, but he's been a cohort participant, has also been a, is a provider for our current cohort through East of the River Clergy Police Community Partnership, and even, as importantly, Reverend Donald Isaac and also Dr. Sam Marilla, who I see in the audience, were both original co-conveners of the Faith-Based Development Initiative back in 2006, so it's a real honor and a blessing to have them here today, and we bring up Reverend Donald Isaac. Good afternoon, and I'm supposed to pray, and I'm going to do that, but I would be remiss because I remember when this building was just a concept, and we met with, uh, you know, Pastor Noah Sharon and others with Israel, so let's give God a hand for this building that we stand in today. Let us pray. God, we acknowledge your presence. We yield to your sovereignty, and we thank you for your blessings. We now pray, God, as we move forward in the deliberations of this day, that we will be sensitive, we will be sensitive to your leading and to your voice, that we will be courageous and creative in developing ways, God, that we might honor our roles as stewardships over the land, and that we might uh, be serious about the legacy, God, that we are empowered to leave for future generations. Now, bless the time together. Give every speaker. Uh, every participant, wisdom from on high, and give us consensus in moving in accordance to your will. And in the name of Jesus the Christ, the risen Savior, I pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. Many thanks to Reverend Isaac. Appreciate it. So I want to welcome all of you all here. It is a blessing. Uh, to be here with all of you all. As I mentioned, this is a major milestone for us to be here for a labor that began back in 2006. That is the year that Enterprise launched our faith-based development initiative here in Washington, D.C. I mentioned already that Reverend Donald Isaac, Dr. Sam Marillo, who are original co-conveners, I was looking to see if our former colleague Deborah Stevenson is here, she may be here later on, was also uh, the original program lead. So we've come a long way. We at Enterprise with our Faith-Based Development Initiative have really four key goals. One is to get new homes and community facilities developed that serve low and moderate income residents and communities. Two, we are very intentional more and more about supporting equitable procurement opportunities for black and brown vendors throughout the development and operations process. Three, we want to strengthen neighborhood anchor institutions i.e. these houses of worship, many who are in this room. And fourth, we talk about wanting to build an enterprise program while also nurturing a national movement that includes but is much bigger than enterprise. We wanted to practice, my friends, what I like to call radical common sense. We want to build the capacity of houses of worship to leverage the power of the land that they are stewards of, this opportunity to solve for some of the pressing housing and community development challenges in your communities. Many houses of worship exist in a sea of need. Like the story of the Bible where the man and folk going to worship, stepping over somebody who's in need, right in the midst of the house of worship. There are people who are paying too much for their housing. There are people who are unhoused, don't have anywhere to call home. There are people who are living in healthy food deserts, affordable child care deserts, and health care deserts. We believed then in 2006, and we believe now, that with an intentional approach, with a relevant set of comprehensive resources, we could build the capacity to build a movement that has multiple layers of impact. We are sitting here today, as Reverend Isaac noted, in a faith-based development initiative-supported development. As Reverend Isaac mentioned, I was sharing with some friends before the event. I definitely remember 
Reverend Dr. Moore Sharon, saying to Deborah and I, as he was coming, as he said to us, to the end of his ministry, that he wanted to make sure that the development he did was impactful for the community, didn't harm the church. He wanted to move with integrity and with impact. That is why we chose this location to have this event, because this is a living witness to the power of what happens when the faith community moves with intention with the development community to try to have impact. So we have, yes, let's give it up for that. We have evolved and grown. We are here today to celebrate the progress of the 17 houses of worship that participated in our enterprise faith-based development initiative, what we like to call DC 1.0. So many thanks, first off, to our friends at the Wells Fargo Foundation for their $1 million investment and to the D.C. Department of Housing and Community Development who invested over $700,000 to help leverage that private investment to support the three-year journey that many of you all have been on. We want to thank both the Wells Fargo Foundation and D.C. DHCD for seeing the vision for impact. And all of you all are well on your way to having an impact in our city. Over 1,100 affordable homes are projected to be built in seven of the eight wards in the District of Columbia. Housing for seniors, housing for veterans, housing for families, rental and home ownership are in the plans. Housing alone and also some mixed-use developments are, are in plan. A million dollars in direct and recoverable grants has been provided to support your efforts over the years. And progress has been made on some key milestones, as you see on the screens. One cohort team has already secured some financing support from the city, Reverend Dickerson. Eight have secured a development partner, and six have active RFPs out now for development partners, and all 17 have a project development concept plan. And let us not forget this progress has been made all in the midst of a global pandemic. So I applaud each of you all for keeping at it in the midst of all of that. A lot of work has taken place by many of you in this room to help make that progress. Over 3,000 hours of support in the form of training, technical support from development consultants, iron sharpens iron, clergy peer learning exchanges, and shepherding support from the enterprise staff. And speaking of the enterprise staff, I want to take a moment to give a big kudos to Reverend Joseph Williams, who has been leading the FBDI effort in the Mid-Atlantic region. In true pastoral fashion, Joe has walked with you, Joe has talked with you, Joe has committed, commiserated with you. In some cases, Joe may have put the proverbial boot to the, to the butt for some of you all. Some of you all, Joe has prayed with. I want to thank Joe for his commitment and his dedication, not only to this work, but to this ministry. And I also want to give a shout out to Jemima O'Cherry. Jemima, please stand up and raise your hand in the back. And our colleague, Jessica Sorrell. Jemima has helped with so much of the work behind the scenes, organizing and communicating with all of you. And Jess was behind the scenes working with Joe and Jemima on the grants and the contracts. And we know that at times there was weeping and gnashing of teeth with the grants. But Jemima and Jess worked with Joe to make sure we could get the money moved. And so thank you for their work. Thank you for your grace. So my friends, today we are here today to hear stories of the road towards your goals. And I'm told that we may even hear these stories in the context of courtship. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Setbacks and comebacks, breakups and makeups. What has helped, what has hurt, what has challenged, and what has inspired you to move forward. As we listen to the stories and the testimonials today, please note that your work is informing how we do what we do across the country and this region. We have active cohorts now in Seattle, Washington, New York City, Baltimore City, Prince George's County, Montgomery County is coming online, Atlanta and Miami are active, Texas is coming online. All of these places around the country 
churches, houses of worship are getting ready or are already engaged in the work that you all have blazed the trail with right here with Cohort 1.0. So I salute you for your work and dedication. And there are some members of our 2.0 cohort who are here and to talk about how the 1.0 cohort is catalytic. The D.C. Department of Housing and Community Development, about a year, year and a half after we started 1.0, saw the vision, saw the work, put a million-dollar RFP on the street. We responded. We were fortunate enough to be selected. So there is a 2.0 cohort of 12 additional houses of worship coming through a pipeline in addition to you. So think of that, 29 congregations in the District of Columbia are being supported to build affordable housing and community facilities in our city. You all are blazing trails and laying the groundwork for more resources for additional houses of worship in our city. So now, my friends, yeah, that's, that's something right there. So now let us move on to hear from two organizations that have been critical to the creation of this cohort. First, I want to bring up to the stage Stacy Spam. Stacy is the head of housing access and affordability for philanthropy at the Wells Fargo Foundation. I already noted the one million dollar one million dollar investment that was catalytic. Stacy brings public experience from the public sector and private sector and the philanthropic sector. But even more important than that, I say often there are people who care who can't, and there are people who can who don't care. And I think we are fortunate to have in Stacy Span a partner who both cares and both can. So, Stacy, come on up. We appreciate you being here with us today. We appreciate you. Good afternoon. Please excuse me. I have a, my wife gave me a cold. The only reason I know that is because I live in her house with her dogs have a nightstand and a place to work. So um, again, my name is Stacy Spann, and I lead housing access and affordability philanthropy for the Wells Fargo Foundation. Our practice takes a nationwide approach as we focus on keeping people housed, driving innovation in housing, and opening doors to access and housing affordability. We're trying to make sure that persons living in historically marginalized communities have access to stable, affordable, and high-quality housing, which provides the foundation for all people to thrive in every, every other aspect of their life. I want to thank my friend, Reverend Bowers, his team at Enterprise, and this room full of esteemed faith leaders for allowing me to share in this celebration of you all and everything that you've accomplished for your congregations, your communities, and especially the folks you work in the house. The strides you've made in just a few short years are both impressive and admirable. At the Wells Fargo Foundation, we invest in philanthropic partners like Enterprise Community Partners, who align with our mission to strengthen historically marginalized communities by supporting pathways to economic advancement and generational wealth. I don't have to tell anyone in this room that the Faith-Based Development Initiative offers us a once in a generation opportunity to address these needs. It's going to take every single person, every tool, every nut, every bolt, every light bulb that we have at our disposal to change the trajectory of people's lives. We know that. We have an opportunity to ensure that scores of children and families don't have to worry about where they're going to lay their heads at night. And that means something. I know because I was one of those kids. I was sharing at the table a little bit earlier that we moved here from Alabama. And uh, my story isn't as amazing as some of those luminaries in our history. I'm not as tall, I'm not as photogenic, but the fact of the matter is that my mother packed us up in a, in a, a Chevrolet Chevette, some of y'all don't even know what car that is, two-tone, not because it was amazing, but just because that was what was on the used car lot. Packed all four of us children up and her, and she drove through the night to Maryland. I was, I was just 14 years old. I hadn't started high school yet. And when we got here, she did every single thing she could in her power to keep me and my siblings fed, clothed, and on the right track. 
as determined, as resourceful as she was, we were still housing insecure. The fact of the matter is, I do this work for her. After making my way to Wall Street as a young man after college, I knew that I was being called to do something that was more than making money for people who were already wealthy. I needed to do something with the shot that I had been given. So I went back to my beginnings and invested in families and communities. Left Wall Street to work for the Upper Manhattan Empowerment Zone. I left that platform of what I thought might be safety and, and to find success for community. I'm doing this work for every single person in Upper Manhattan. As faith-based organizations, you stand to play an incredibly powerful role in housing and economic development. You sit at the center of many communities. Not only do you touch countless lives every day, but the honest ties you maintain with those families means you have a level of empathy and deeper understanding of their needs, more so than mostly any other institution. You're doing this work for us with love and compassion. And at the end of the day, not a single one of us can hope to achieve any progress in getting people housed by ourselves. I learned a long time ago that thoughtful, strategic, and genuine partnerships are the best way to make meaningful strides toward achieving more affordable and equitable outcomes. A healthy dose of humility and openness to learning from one's peers is also a recipe for success. In his great wisdom, Reverend Bowers included a peer learning and convening component in this initiative. And what is truly to be gained from that is the opportunity to learn, grow, and sharpen in order to serve the greater good, whether it's personal or professional. I've always adhered to the principle that your journey, your path should be about two things, openness and improvement. That means being open to growing your perspective, fostering a curious mind, and learning as much as you can, and striving to leave systems, organizations, and people better than you found them. Indeed, if we're serious about this work, then we need to broaden not just our lens, but our tent. We have to be willing to put unconventional options on the table, seek out unconventional partnerships, and step out of our comfort zones and away from characterizations of this problem as intractable. I want to thank each and every one of you in this first cohort for setting the tone by showing up as your authentic and vulnerable selves to this work with a willingness to learn even as leaders and often only problem solvers in your organizations and often problem solvers in your organizations and lives. Thank you for setting the table for the cohorts that come behind you for your compatriots in Seattle, Miami, New York, Atlanta, and, and all over the United States who will learn from your triumphs, but also your setbacks. And thank you for rising to the challenge to turn your work and learnings into a national housing movement that will unite so many of us around what matters most, people. Thank you. Congratulations. Many thanks to Stacy Spann. I appreciate that. And again, thinking about referencing the catalytic effort, the initial million dollar investment that was put into this cohort by Wells Fargo Foundation, since that time, just with Enterprise alone, they've invested an additional eight and a half million dollars to support faith based developmental work around the country. So we appreciate the catalytic effect, again, that this cohort has had with private sector investors to get more dollars flowing. Now, on the public sector side, we are fortunate that we are joined today by Colleen Green, who is the director of the D.C. Department of Housing and Community Development. I mentioned that uh, DHCD put in over $700,000 to support Cohort 1, another million dollars to support Cohort 2. Colleen has both, as, as Stacy does, both public and private sector experience in her career, and I will say that she is no rookie to FBDI because many years ago, pre-COVID, when we were doing cohorts in Baltimore City, uh, Colleen was one of the people who sat on one of the shark tanks, responded to shark tanks to give feedback to houses of worship. 
So she's been walking with us in the FBDI world for a while. So if we can, let's give a hand to Director Colleen Green from the D.C. Department of Housing. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So good to see you. I bring greetings today from Mayor Muriel Bowser and Deputy Mayor Nina Albert. I'm sorry they could not be here today to join you. As you know, we're in a very tough budget negotiation season. But thank you for having me. Let me start by saying that I believe this is a pivotal moment for Houses of Worship and their affordable housing advocacy. Last Friday was an extremely celebratory moment for the district's Muslim community who repurposed the land of the Clara Muhammad School and turned it into an 81-unit affordable housing apartment building on Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue in Ward 8. You can tell that when Imam Talib Sharif from the Majid Muhammad spoke about the journey from idea to ribbon cutting, it was all worth it and needed a lot of faith involved. There was pride, there was joy, there was a so strong sense of accomplishment that a promise was fulfilled. And yet, if you read in the Washington Post the next day, it appeared that houses of worship weren't doing enough to create more affordable housing. The article highlighted some challenges faced by churches with shrinking congregations in Maryland and Virginia, who also struggled to produce affordable housing. But in the district, there have been several churches who have been successful in achieving the affordable housing vision. Here are just a few examples. Living Word Church with the Trinity Plaza, a mixed-use building with 49 units of affordable housing in Ward 8. Emory Fellowship Beacon Center, a mixed-use project with 99 units of affordable housing in Ward 4. Bible Way Church's work with Plaza West, a 223-unit affordable housing complex in Ward 6, and Israel's Baptist Church's own 47-unit affordable housing project, Visionary Square in Ward 5. To the FBDI cohorts, I hope you will continue the progress that the churches have made. I believe that you will give us even more reasons to celebrate what can be done by churches who want to leverage their resources for their members, for their communities, to produce affordable housing. But the keys to completing any housing project are purpose, perseverance, belief, and faith. My purpose today is clear, to encourage you to keep going, believe, and have faith again. Thank you for having me today and allowing the D.C. Department of Housing and Community Development to be a resource in your affordable housing goals. Thank you.